Okay, I'm sure some, some more people will join us as, uh, as we go. Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, everybody, or wherever you may be. I'm Stephen Grust, and I am the head of SIA's African Governance and Dipl Diplomacy Program. Uh, we work a lot on uh, African political and governance issues. And today we're delighted to present some research by our senior research fellow, Stephanie Walters, on what's happening in the Great Lakes region and the, re the, the need for a regional lens on understanding and, and tackling the, the many and overlapping problems that are found in the Great Lakes region of Africa. Uh, Stephanie's just published a paper and uh, I'll ask uh, Ndumi a little bit later to, to uh, put the link up so you can have a, a copy of the paper. Um, but today she's going to be exploring some of the material on that. She is a, a real expert in the region. Uh, she knows a lot about it and has traveled there frequently, has great contacts um, on, the, on the issue. And uh, I'm just going to wait uh, another two minutes because we, we, uh, we have some time. Um, and then we'll ask Stephanie to kick off uh, and really uh, unpack this question for us on how do these interrelated societies and conflicts, uh, what, what are the patterns, and, and most importantly, what can be done about them. Um, so in fact, I'm going to hand over now to Stephanie, and people will join us as, as they go. Stephanie, it's all yours. If I can just ask uh, Ndumi to stop sharing the, the PowerPoint, you're welcome to uh, participate on social media. Our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn uh, addresses are there. If you would like to raise a, an issue or ask a question, please do so. You can do so in the Q&A section. If, there's, if you'd like to chat, you can use the chat function. Um, and we look forward to a stimulating, interesting, and thought-provoking discussion. So, uh, Stephanie, over to you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thanks to Saya and Okapi Consulting for making this possible. Um, as Steve said, this is really a discussion today of a paper that was, rec that was recently released about the need for a new uh, political process uh, that takes a regional approach to instability and peace in the Great Lakes region and which was published by Saya uh, this past month. Um, the English version has been out for a few weeks and a French version will be coming out in, in the coming weeks, um, which will be widely circulated and there will also be a French uh, language um, seminar to, to launch it in French uh, in the coming weeks. So what, what is this paper really about? This paper is essentially about the fact that um, in the Great Lakes we have um, had now two and a half, three decades of chronic instability. Um, the, 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 the place where most of this instability has been uh, central is, is the Eastern DRC, of course, um, but many different actors playing a, a destabilizing role there, uh, many different actors who are Congolese, but also of the region. Um, but at the same time, we've had uh, most of the approaches to trying to uh, resolve these, these, this chronic instability be either very focused on diagnosing the problem only from the perspective of DRC governance failures, um, or we've had, in terms of interventions, a very limited focus on, on military questions. And so this paper is really an argument to say um, it's time for us to look at this from a regional perspective and to have a new concerted, sustained uh, political process that brings together the leadership of the core Great Lakes countries, in other words, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and the DRC. So what, what, does such a, what would such a process mean? Um, and, and just to give a quick overview of what I'll be looking at today, I'll first be discussing what such a process would, would mean, what a political process from a regional perspective would mean. Why are we talking about this now? Or why is now a good time or an important time to have such a process? What are the, the drivers that we've um, been able to diagnose as um, fundamentally uh, driving instability in the Great Lakes region over the last three decades? Who are some of the key actors um, in the peace and security space in, um, in the Great Lakes? And then finally, some, some, some recommendations to throw out there about how we might get such a regional process um, going and who should be leading on that. So that's, that's a brief overview of, of what I'll be talking about today. So the first question is, what does a political process in the Great Lakes region look like that involves uh, the region? Well, essentially, it's a question of looking at the political security, economic and military drivers of instability in the Eastern DRC and the region. 
This would include looking at tensions at the bilateral level between countries like Uganda and Rwanda, and also Rwanda and Burundi, who have uh, at the moment very tense and difficult relations. Such a process must include an examination of governance issues, not just in the DRC, but also in Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi themselves. So in other words, looking at what drives instability in those countries and what drives that instability to be exported to the Eastern DRC, what are the dynamics there? That's one of the elements of a diagnosis of, uh, by, in a regional political process. Um, Another question is looking at these drivers comprehensively and addressing them holistic, holistically. In other words, not just through the narrow approach of military operations. We've seen over many, many years that military operations, both formal and informal, and that is also a, a, a major problem we have in the Eastern DRC, often informal uh, military operations, but even formal military operations not succeeding in creating stability there, not succeeding in ending armed violence. And so we need those operations to be complemented by a regional political process. Um, and we also must, I think, readjust the, the or, or, or re reposition the conflict narrative, where instead of saying that the point of departure of instability is always the uh, poor governance in, in Kinshasa and the Congolese government and the Congolese army's inability to control its own territory. Those are central, of course, but they are not the only point of departure. We have to widen this analysis to looking at the dynamics in Burundi, in Rwanda, and in Uganda, and between those countries and the relationship with the DRC if we want to really try uh, and have a holistic and, I think, uh, effective approach to stabilizing the Eastern uh, DRC and the entire region. And of course that will demand a, a large amount of political will. I'll, I'll get to that question a little bit later on. Um, now, the question of why are we talking about this now? Um, as I said already, there has been chronic instability in Eastern Congo and in parts of the uh, Great Lakes for decades. Um, we do see spikes and highs and lows in terms of violence. Um, but fundamentally, uh, citizens of the Eastern DRC in particular have, have had to grow accustomed to living with chronic instability and violence. Um, it's still one of the most, um, one of the areas of the world where there are largest numbers of IDPs, uh, largest concentration of humanitarian actors and uh, where humanitarian needs are still extremely high. And so there's no arguing that the, the instability continues. Um, and the existing arrangements to try and address this simply haven't worked. Um, I've spoken a little bit about the military, the overemphasis on military um, uh, uh, approaches, but even the, the regional organizations that we have operating there, whether it be the International Conference on the Great Lakes Region, SADC, of which the DRC is a member, um, even um, the, the Peace and Security Council, a PSC framework, sorry, agreement, the Addis Ababa Accords of 2013, haven't functionally changed the situation on the ground. And so it's time that we take, I think, a new approach to this. Um, there's been an overemphasis and an over-reliance on military operations in the last, last 25 years. There's an ongoing lack of transparency regarding formal and informal regional military interventions. And that's something that we've seen again over the last six months with um, the incursions by the Rwandan army into, the, into Eastern DRC. Um, it's something we've had uh, prevalent there for, for many decades. There's also a, still a prevailing climate of distrust uh, not just between uh, presidents of the region and the leadership in Kinshasa, but between, as I said earlier, Rwanda and Uganda, and also Burundi and Rwanda, um, and of course, between the leaders of those countries and Kinshasa. And then there are rising and persistent tensions that I think we, we, we've all been focused on and other organizations have also looked at this. Um, what, what exactly is going to happen if Rwanda and Uganda continue to uh, down this path of, of closed borders and not interacting with one another? Do, are we looking at another potential war in the Great Lakes region, a war that would most likely again play itself out on Eastern uh, Congolese territory? And similarly between Burundi and Rwanda. Uh, where we also have those kinds of tensions with the government of um, Burundi accusing Rwanda of supporting uh, anti-government rebels, again, based um, allegedly in Eastern Congo. So those are all the, I think, challenges that are still very much there that are persisting that um, would it, it impel us really to try and take a new approach and a more sustained approach and a political approach or add a layer of, of, of a political approach to, to resolving conflict in the Great Lakes. 
But I also think that there, there are opportunities that we, we can't miss. And I think we, those of us who work on the Great Lakes uh, know how rare it is to have a, a real opportunity, real change in that region where we've had the leadership um, of Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, and then now also for Congo until 2018, um, being the same people for many, many years. Now, with the arrival of Felix Tshisekedi in power, however contested uh, that election um, is, there is a new opportunity. Felix Tshisekedi is not himself someone who comes from a military background. He was not part of a, an armed movement that brought him to power, which of course is the way in which that uh, way in which Museveni and Kagame and also Ndaishimiye came to power over the years. So he has a completely, he's a civilian with a completely different uh, background. He also has no history in the region um, and as having been involved in any of the of the, the different conflicts as having played a role there. And so he's a new actor there and, and, and brings somewhat, uh, I would say, a breath of fresh air. Um, and then, of course, one of the more ironic, I suppose, things is that Chisikiri, again, despite the way in which the election was conducted, um, is the leader, I would argue, who probably has the most legitimacy in the region at the moment. Um, there is a social contract between the Congolese population and Chisikiri that was forged when the Congolese population chose to accept the official outcome of the election. And today, the, 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 the attitude still is the prevailing attitude teetering a little bit, but still tends to be that um, Chisikedi uh, should be given an opportunity to, to change the way the, the, the Congo is governed. And then finally, because Chisikedi is a, is, a, is a new player and because there was so much of a push to, to get Kabila to leave office, there's a lot of international engagement um, and a lot of uh, international desire to see Chisikedi succeed. And that extends not just to uh, the, the efforts he's making at a domestic level with, with better governance uh, and more transparency, but also to um, his efforts within the region. And we know that one of the areas, despite the political arrangement that came out of the 2018 elections where the Kabila camp still controls parliament and many of the provincial assemblies, we know that one of the areas in which Chisikedi is able to have more um, room for maneuver, more space, more independence, and to be more strategic is international relations. And he has exercised that quite, quite steadily since he came to power, um, visiting Uganda and, uh, Congo, uh, and, and sorry, um, Rwanda several times, and, and really making that one of the key elements of his, his first year in office. Um, there is also, and I don't know whether this is an opportunity or not, um, I'd like to think it is, the fact that Chisikedi will be pres presiding over the African Union next year, and of course that's a key player in peace and security on the continent and in, in the region. So those to me are opportunities. Um, I think that if we miss the opportunity to try and um, nurture some positive and new regional relations out of this, this presidency in its early days, um, we, we will have, we will have, we really will have failed. Um, and I think that there's a lot of support we can provide as, as policymakers, as analysts and so on to the Chisikidi government in trying to um, get the best out of some of these initiatives that he's taking. And of course, tomorrow we, we will, we will, um, um, there will be in Goma, the, um, the Goma summit will take place. It is a virtual summit after several attempts to hold it physically. It's now being held online. Um, but the presidents of Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi at last notice were participating. And this is a summit about um, peace and security in the region. So it's, it is a priority for Chisikidi. And I feel we need to really take advantage of that and try and support it as much as possible. Um, and I also think that if, if Chisikidi's approach, if, 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 if he gets that wrong, if I can put it that way, there are, there are risks that the situation will deteriorate or that we will have just a simple continuation of the status quo in, in, quo in particular in, uh, in Eastern Congo. And I'll speak about that in a little more detail, what I mean about that uh, when I get to the section on, on, on the different spoilers who possibly do not want stability in the Eastern DRC. And then finally, there are other, other developments in the region. Of course, there's a new president in Burundi. Um, we, we don't yet really know what to make of uh, how, he will, uh, how he will design his presidency, uh, whether he will fundamentally change the way the country is governed and uh, uh, allow freedom of political expression and so on. But it is an opportunity uh, to re-engage with a new actor. Um, and likewise, we have uh, elections coming up in Uganda in 2021, which I think could also be a, a, a potential for a, a potential flashpoint as much as an opportunity to, to try and engage. So that's the, that's the why of, um, of this um, 
of this paper, why, why we're putting this idea of a, of, a re, of a regional political process on the table now. I want to now turn to um, a quick analysis of some of the um, drivers that we, we can, I think, establish are at the fundamental base of instability in the region um, over, the last, over the last 30 years. Um, I think at the very beginning, we have, to be, we have to be clear that there are legitimate security concerns that uh, Congo's neighbors have, Congo's Eastern neighbors, neighbors, I should say, because this is primarily about its neighbors in the Great Lakes. Um, and, and, and those go back a, a very long time. Obviously, Rwanda, the new Tutsi government, um, um, very concerned about the concentration of, of Hutu refugees and among them inter uh leaders and, 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 and combatants who were um, in Eastern DRC in 1994. Um, that gives rise to the end of the Mobutu era and the coalition that overthrows uh, Mobutu eventually. And, and, and that um, security concern of Rwanda's, I think, at the time, very legitimate. Um, continues to prevail and continues to essentially uh, drive that relationship and also Rwanda's formal involvement in, in Congo until about 2003. Um, there is uh, a continuation of that to some extent in, 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 in some of the subsequent movements that Rwanda supports, including Laurent Kunda's CNDP, uh, which argued that it was protecting Congolese Tutsi in the Banyamulenge, which was supported by Rwanda, the CNDP later becoming the M23. Um, um, but if if we're if we're I think honest I think the, the 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 group that really represented a significant threat back then to the to Rwanda was the FDLR and of course the FDLR at the time in the in the late 90s and the early 2000s had an alliance with the Kabila government Kabila father government and 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 that particular alliance was a real threat to Rwanda things have changed very considerably uh, since then and I think today it would be um, it would be an exaggeration to say that that there is a real threat posed by a particular um, uh, existing group in, in Eastern Congo today. Um, obviously, lots of military operations conducted by the Congolese army, in some, some cases also with Rwandan support against the FDLR and its splinter groups over the years, including in late 2019 and 2020, um, that have su substantially weakened uh, that particular group. The other group that today for Rwanda uh, or that Rwanda uh, often mentions as representing a security threat is the Rwanda National Congress, which is uh, led by um, General Faustin Nyamwasa, who himself is under uh, security. It, it lives in South Africa. Um, and there have been many allegations that the RNC is working with various different um, uh, other armed groups in the Eastern DRC, but that is the other group about which Rwanda expresses grave concern and which it also accuses Uganda of supporting. Um, so there are some obvious security interests that, that have, that have um, driven the relationship and the involvement, formal and informal, by uh, Congo's neighbors in, in the DRC uh, over the years. Um, but I, I would argue that those are su substantially weaker today than they were and have essentially for the last probably 15 years or so uh, served as a, as a pretext for, for Rwanda's continue, continued involvement. Much more tangible is the fact, um, and you, Rwanda and Uganda, much more tangible is the fact that over the, ta over the, over the years of, of, of its present, presence in, um, in Eastern Congo, Rwanda and Uganda in particular, and their militaries of civilian and military elites developed substantial interest in natural resources in the Eastern, Eastern Congo. Now, this is something that has, been, uh, that has been documented by many different actors. I won't go into too much detail, but what's interesting is that the system and the networks and the drivers that were essentially um, implanted in, in the early 2000s are still very much um, are still very much underpin uh, the, 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 the role that Rwanda and Uganda play today in, in the Eastern DRC. Um, and of course, this network is one that includes military actors from DRC itself, Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi, who are involved in these activities and benefit substantially from them. So that we now have a regional mafia of armed actors that includes politicians, business people, military leaders who co cooperate along different axes and benefit financially from the substantial illicit trade in minerals and other goods. Um, and these are people whose interests, uh, who are able to protect their interests and who are able to protect them politically and militarily, which is why it has been so incredibly difficult to try and address this very entrenched network of, of illegal exploitation. Um, today, we still have smuggling routes out of the DRC for gold, tin, tungsten, tantalum, cobalt, and other valuable minerals, which go through Kigali, Bujumbura, and Kampala. 
and which drain revenue from the DRC's coffers. And armed groups are heavily involved in illegal mining, derive substantial revenue from these activities. Some armed groups are involved in um, armed activities in order to have access to this revenue and others derive the revenue they need to continue uh, from those activities. Um, so, so that is still a very much um, a, a, a key issue. Um, of course, there have been attempts to address this track and tracing certification initiatives, which have been, um, which have been introduced by, by the ICGLR, by the EU, by the OECD, uh, and many others, um, which essentially, essentially try to aim the, the source of minerals and tag them where they are mined electronically or manually. And that is meant to prevent smuggling um, and is meant to, to, to make sure that revenue is paid where, where it needs to be paid. But these systems rely largely on, on local actors to, uh, to enforce them, um, and that hasn't really been uh, done properly. Um, and it's essentially such a, such, a, such a lucrative system for those who are involved in it that it's very difficult for these track and trace uh, uh, mechanisms, schemes, to really uh, compete against the, that kind of money and, and, and those kinds of networks. So, so that has not yet been um, effective. It is, I think, one of the key elements that we need to look at uh, when we look at um, uh, how we what we talk about in this regional political process that I'm trying that I'm, that I'm proposing. Um, linked to this is the question of Congolese spoilers. Um, now I'll talk about this a little bit later, but obviously if we're if we're trying to sort of nurture um, or we're trying to encourage a political process uh, led by Chisikidi, um to, to address some of these entrenched interests and the networks, then that means that Chisikidi will have to take on a, a, a large group of very powerful players. And they aren't just Congolese, but they are also Congolese. And of course, when I speak of that Congolese network, I'm speaking primarily about people who are linked to former president uh, Joseph Kabila, uh, whether they be military or civilian actors, and who um, have a network that is extensive and deeply entrenched and plays a substantial role in national and local politics and the power dynamics and the profits from these activities also support national politicians and they've been a pivotal element in the civil and military patronage network that is a central source of Joseph Kabila's political and military power even now. And so clearly touching that system, trying to dismantle that system, which would be a central element of a, of a political process will be risky and there will be spoilers and it, it, it's, 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 it's a difficult task to take on. But quite frankly, that would be difficult for anybody who came into power. It's not just uh, something that will be difficult for Chisikidi, uh, even though he has this, this uh, uh, strong relationship or this, this, this uh, how shall I put it? Um, the, she's shackled by his relationship with, with, the, the, with, the, with the, the majority led by Kabila. Um, but it is something that that one needs to watch, and that's, I guess, a, a question of sequencing how you address some of these uh, these bigger drivers. Um, so the next um, driver of instability in the East that I would I would argue is is a very fundamental one, and one that perhaps hasn't been looked at as much as it should be, is the question of the extent to which um, the the groups that we're seeing in Eastern Congo are essentially. Uh, as the result of Rwanda and Uganda exporting the domestic challenges that they face. Um, and not intentionally, but it's, it's a question of, you know, having a, a, an environment in both Rwanda um, and Uganda, but in particular in Rwanda and also Burundi, where it is, it, it's essentially impossible to be a, a political opponent or a critic of the government uh, without being imprisoned or, or killed or harassed. And so that has driven many uh, uh, actors to conclude that the only way in which to challenge Kagame is to do so uh, militarily. Now, it's not a question of my condoning this or not. It's just simply a phenomenon that we see uh, and that I think um, we don't often enough discuss these links between the way the, the environments, the governance challenges, the, the human rights challenges in these countries that are neighboring the DRC and how that means that um, the fertile ground that Eastern Congo, that is this, this, this improperly governed territory in Eastern Congo um, is, is, is available to those who conclude that um, trying to contest democratically uh, politics in, in Uganda and Rwanda and Burundi simply uh, isn't possible and therefore choose to go into armed opposition. Um, it's something that we saw, for example, um, 
with with the dynamics in Burundi in 2015, where we had ahead of the, the election there um, and in Kurunziza's contested third mandate, his controversial third mandate, um, the, the opposition essentially being driven out into exile. And then some of those opposition leaders concluding that they would better contest politics in, in Burundi uh, with, with an armed movement. Um, that is the case, for example, for Red Tabara, which is led, led by Alexis Nduije. Now, the, the allegation there by Burundi is that Rwanda is supporting that particular group. Red Tabara is essentially, uh, insofar as we know very much about it, we know that it is um, operational or that it uses the DRC as a base. And so that's an instance where um, the domestic developments in Burundi have led to another armed group basing itself in, um, in the Eastern DRC, creating alliances with some of the existing uh, armed groups that are already there, and then raising tensions, for example, between Congo and Rwanda, but also obviously between Burundi and, 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 and Rwanda. So um, I think we really need to look very closely at, um, at, at what the domestic situations are in Congo's neighbors and not just in Congo. And, for example, if you look at the Addis Ababa Accords of 2013, the Peace, Security, and Cooperation Framework, I think one of the um, one of the things that weakens it um, is that it isn't a regional uh, approach. It's very much the the center or the point of departure is Congo has the problems and needs to fix them domestically, and the the regional actors, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, need to focus on not supporting uh, armed groups, but don't need to actually investigate the way in which their own uh, styles of governance are driving that. And that is, is certainly fundamental to why we don't have stability um, in, in the Eastern DRC. With, with, the, with, the, with Uganda, it's a slightly different dynamic. Um, President Museveni um, is not really facing an armed group in Eastern Congo that threatens his government. The ADF is nominally, I would argue, a, a, a Ugandan, um, it certainly has origins in, in Uganda, but it is not a movement today that, in my view, represents a threat to the Ugandan government. Um, but in, it, 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 is, it, it, it does say that it wants to overthrow Museveni. I think, I think for Museveni, um, the, the involvement in the East is to a great extent about um, uh, some, in, in, in some ways with, the, with regards to his relationship to Rwanda, but also um, a way to shore up his political patronage network and the greed of the military and civilian elites, which he needs to maintain in order to stay in power. So it's a slightly different dynamic, but again, a question of a Ugandan domestic issue becoming a factor of instability in Eastern Congo. Um, we also see, and, and this again is, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the reasons why I think it's an acute, it's an, there's an acute need for a regional dialogue, a lot of tension and competition in the Great Lakes region. Now, Uganda and Rwanda back in uh, 1996 and 97 joined forces and overthrew Mobutu um, with the help of, a, of, of Laurent Kabila and a, and, a, and a Congolese rebel coalition, but their relationship has been tense for many, many years. And that tension first really came to, came to a head in Kisangani in, in 1999 and 2000, when the armies of those two countries fought uh, over access to, to diamonds and gold, um, killing thousands of, of Congolese civilians. And that, that relationship has really never, never quite recovered. Um, there's a lot of rivalry between um, Museveni and between Kagame, and we've seen over the last um, two years that the relationship has really reached a new low point. Rwanda accusing Uganda of supporting the Rwanda National Congress led by Kayuma Nyamwasa, while Uganda says that um, Rwanda is supporting the ADF and infiltrating its own security services and pursuing anti-Rwandan dissidents illegally on its territory. So very uh, strong allegations on both sides. Um, there is a, a historical relationship between the two leaders. They know each other very well. Kagame uh, helped Museveni come to power. Uh, and I think that this is a, a relationship that's very complex and very difficult to try and mediate because it is very much a, a personal one, but it is also a, a, a key one in the region because it, it, it really is a, the, the, the tensions between those two countries is really a threat to stability. Um, and so I think it, it, it is something that needs to be addressed. Now, we do know that Chisikedi has, um, with Angola, uh, started a quadripartite uh, dialogue that uh, includes Uganda and Rwanda and has been attempting to mediate between, between the two. Um, the last summit, to my knowledge, took place in February 2020 before we all had to, um, to, to, to put everything on hold. Um, but 
there, there, I think there are, there's still a long road there, uh, in particular in investigating some of these questions about um, what kind of support different countries are giving to different um, rebel groups. Um, in my view, this is something that could very easily be discussed in a regional political dialogue because it has many of the same dynamics that we see overall in the region. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there in terms of the drivers. And I now wanted to get to some of the, the regional peace initiatives that we do have um, and talk about why those have or haven't been effective and um, look also at some of the, the RECs, SADC and the ICGLR and, and what they have and haven't been able to achieve in terms of stability. Um, I'll start with the peace, security and cooperation framework, which was signed in 2013. Um, I have mentioned it a few times now. Again, it is the it is fundamentally um, the, the the peace accord that was signed by the core countries of the Great Lakes region, um, eleven plus four. Um, it has um, the guarantors uh, as as its guarantors, the UN, the AU, SADC, and the ICGLR. And fundamentally, it was aimed at trying to halt regional involvement in Eastern Congo and trying to halt the proliferation of armed movements supported by one or other regional regional government. It, it, it was born um, in the context of the M23 uh, rebel group, which had briefly taken control of Goma um, and which um, was, yeah. And so the, there was a time and a place really where, where, where this particular thing, this particular framework was born. Um, and I, as I've already said, I think that it needs to reposition its fundamental focus and be focused on the region and on each individually to, in an equal measure rather than focusing only or over focusing on the, uh, the DRC and its governance failures. But I think that it, 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 it has had some very, it has played some very useful roles. Um, it has, for example, at least kept the different parties speaking at a regional level. It's the only forum that, that does that. Um, it has made some progress on um, joint intelligence operations, getting intelligence chiefs to meet one another. Um, it has worked closely with some of the mechanisms that were established by the uh, International Conference on the Great Lakes region, notably the um, Enhanced Joint Verification Mission, sorry, mechanism. Um, and the Joint Intelligence Fusion Center. So where we have security actors in a region where there's great amount of distrust actually sharing to some extent some information, speaking to one another uh, and working together. And I think for those reasons, it is a, a very useful body. It is a useful forum. Um, it is recognized by the leaders of the, of the region as being that. And in my view, this is the ideal um, sort of host for this kind of a political dialogue that I'm proposing, um, because it has all the mechanisms in place, because the heads of state acknowledge it, because the international bodies that we need on board for something like that are also part of it. Um, the PSC does hold an annual um, uh, meeting of heads of state um, once a year. It was not held this year uh, because of the COVID um, and it was not held last year because it was delayed and the host was Kinshasa and then it was due to be held in March this year. Um, but I, I do think that this is the kind of, of, of forum that is, that is very helpful, but it needs to become, it needs to be assisted and I'll, I'll, it needs to be assisted because we don't yet have the political will from these key countries to engage or submit to a political process um, in which their interests are, are addressed or threatened or um, challenged. Um, and so the PSCF on its own has not never been able to impose itself as the kind of forum where those difficult conversations would 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 be would take place, um, or where it could impose solutions and answers. And so I think while it's a useful forum, uh, it, it's going to need to be accompanied by other important key players um, that are in the in the peace and security landscape in 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 in, in the con on the continent. Um, um, the PSCF and the, which is whose home is the UN off, uh, the UN Special Envoy to the Great Lakes Office, um, that's who manages and administers essentially acts as a secretariat for the PSC, is in the middle of coming up with a new regional strategy for the United Nations um, in the Great Lakes, and hopefully that is an opportunity to really try and widen the scope of some of these conversations, and to get a, a more profound analysis of how instability in the region can and must be tackled. Um, 
So, so that's that's where I think the the emphasis should lie. I I will just briefly speak about the ICGLR and SADC. Now, the ICGLR is a regional mechanism, and as such, uh, is is doesn't have quite the um, strength of mandate that, uh, for example, the SADC does or the East African Community does. The advantage is that it 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 has it has as, as its members all the core countries of the Great Lakes, and this is the only regional body that uh, counts uh, all four core countries uh, as its members. Um, and it has uh, had some, some, some important moments over the years. Um, for example, the um, attempt to resolve the M23 crisis through a political dialogue with uh, the Kampala dialogue, which was um, uh, held under the aegis of Museveni, with who then held the, the Uganda then held the presidency. Um, of the of the ICGLR, and there was also a time where where the ICGLR presidency then under Angola, um, where the ICGLR worked closely with SADC, um, for example, also around the question of the mandate term limits for for Kabila, um, that was then driven uh, fundamentally by by Angola, which held the presidency and which was able to kind of bring ICGLR into the fold. There are. Um, reasons that there are rivalries, I should say, between the two or between the members of the two. I think the ICGLR for a long time, especially, um, yeah, was was dominated by U by Ugandan and Rwandan interests, uh, whereas SADC was very much um, seen and behaved often as though it was um, interested more in the interests of the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is a member of SADC. There are no other Great Lakes countries at present that are a member of SADC, which means that SADC is a little bit of a of, of an odd odd man out in, in in the Great Lakes region, and certainly uh, Rwanda and Uganda have 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 made that very clear that they don't think SADC has a role to play there. But there's there there are real limitations to what these two uh, bodies have been able to do. Again, in terms of imposing themselves, in terms of taking. Uh, uh, taking a strong voice um, that is respected in the region. Um, we do know, of course, and this is a, an important reason why SADC has to be at the table, that SADC uh, put together the Force Intervention Brigade um, that is now still um, deployed under MONUSCO leadership in the Eastern Congo. Um, and, and so there is, a, 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 without a doubt, a role for SADC and, and ICGLR to play as supporters, I think, of, of, a, of a regional political process. Now, the East African community, which I bring in largely because, of course, it is uh, the regional economic community that, that brings together uh, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. Um, and it's also sort of dangling membership to the DRC. And Chisikiti has responded quite positively um, to that. I think there's, there are obvious uh, reasons why uh, Congo would, 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 uh, would fit into that grouping in terms of the fact that it's uh, borders uh, many of the member countries and that much of its trade and uh, interests will, will be going and looking to East Africa and always have. Um, in my sense is that the membership is much more a way for, I think, Kagame in particular to kind of bring uh, Chisikidi closer politically to Rwanda um, and perhaps bring distance a little bit from um, from Angola and South Africa. Uh, and I don't really see that politically the East African community at this point has any real role to play in, 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 in the dynamic around the, the, the Great Lakes countries. And I think we've seen from the Burundi crisis that it, is, it has great limitations there um, and hasn't been able, for example, to bring to any kind of real fruition the Burundi dialogue, which is now uh, fundamentally um, sort of shelved. Um, so I, I'm not sure that that would be a, a useful player to bring in here. Um, I'm going to end uh, because I've been speaking for quite some time now on, on some recommendations. I think that in, in my view, um, this is the, this political process of which I've been speaking um, needs to be led by the African Union. The African Union should, should take the initiative on this kind of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a process and nominate a former head of state to mediate. Um, and ensure that the issue of regional peace is firmly on the agenda of the African Union Peace and Security Council. Um, now, we can talk more about how possible we think that is, but I, I think that that's where this has to come from. Um, if, if people want to be serious about bringing a stability to the Great Lakes region. Again, of course, I, uh, SADC and the ICGLR have to work together. Um, I think they have to build synergies between exi existing initiatives like the FIB, the um, Enhanced Joint Verification Mission, uh, and others. Um, again, the UN uh, Office for the um, 
of the special envoy to the Great Lakes should be the functional home for a regionally driven political process. It already has the infrastructure to do that. It should act as a support to the AU mediator. And I think also align its own mandate uh, with new regional priorities and a new regional outlook and lens. The international community, I haven't talked much here about it, but um, hopefully we'll talk about it in the questions, is fundamental to all of this. I think that if the international community, and by that I mean primarily Western donors, um, doesn't take a, a, a regional wide approach to, to, to these issues, uh, we won't be able to push this idea of a regional conversation. And this is particularly so on questions of human rights uh, and democracy. We know that Rwanda um, of course, increasingly is criti criticized, but it has always had sort of a special status. And I think that we need to move beyond that if we, if we want to have a real conversation about peace and stability in the Great Lakes. There are dozens of, well, dozens, there, there, there's about a dozen bilateral special envoys who should engage with and support a regional political process under lead of the African mediator and the international contact group on the Great Lakes, which already exists um, and includes Angola and South Africa could be repurposed to support such a process. Um, and then finally, this is a particular uh, final recommendation is that I think we, we need more clarity about who's supporting what. Uh, we, we go round and around in circles with these allegations. We do have, of course, a group of experts of the United Nations that has been working uh, tirelessly since 2001, uh, different mandates to, to look into all these different allegations of who's supporting who. I think we need to get real clarity on that, to, to put that out to the different people at the, at the, at the discussion table and, and, and not allow this, these rumors and this, these allegations to, 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 to dog uh, a real conversation. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, uh, Stephanie, and a round of applause from everybody for uh, a really great presentation. Your depth of knowledge of so many of the in intricate and uh, complex dynamics uh, is, is uh, impressive. So thank you. So far, we've had three questions. Um, I'll ask them one by one, and then you, I'll ask them one by one so you can give a full answer. And then um, uh, please keep your questions coming. You can use the chat box or the Q&A box. So from Lucas Serra uh, says, how do you see the future of peacekeeping in the region? MONUSCO proved itself unable to halt violent action of rebel groups, even with the existence of the intervention brigade. Will we see a regional coalition such as the ones we see in the Sahel? Okay. Um, should I answer that directly, yeah, Steve? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So. Um, it's a good question. I mean, MONUSCO has reviewed its mandate, and, and of course, we all know that it is, it's drawing down. Um, I think part of the problem is MONUSCO sort of ping-ponged between political mission um, at different times and then uh, a military-focused uh, peacekeeping mission in a situation where, where the, 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 the circumstances and the context were frequently changing um, and where there wasn't often peace to keep. And so I think you know, the, the, the moments when MONUSCO or MONUC before were most criticized was when we had these kinds of incursions by regionally backed armed groups like the M23 or the CNDP. Um, and when, when MONUSCO was, was basically unable to, to prevent uh, those armed groups from taking cities like Goma and Bukavu and, and people stood by and said, you know, why do we have a peacekeeping force here if, we, if they can't even prevent that kind of a thing? Um, now that's not really the dynamic that we, that, 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 that a peacekeeping mission is meant to be deployed in. And so I think there's a fundamental uh, mismatch there. Um, although of course the, the mandate has become more robust over time and, and, and the FIB's mandate is very robust. Um, so I think that MONUSCO, to, to answer your question directly, I think MONUSCO's role would inevitably be uh, uh, made dramatically easier if it was working in an environment where you had a real commitment, um, a renewed commitment and where you had uh, some kind of um, repercussion for violating uh, the different agreements, um, not to interfere in matters of the DRC, internal matters, or internal matters of Rwanda, Uganda, or Burundi. Um, there's been no sanctioning at all of, of, of the role of, of the incursions by Rwanda, Uganda um, in, in Congo um, ever. Uh, well, there, there is the, the, the International Court of Justice, uh, but I'll leave that one out. Um, and, and, so, and so fundamentally, um, you, you, need a, you, need a, you need a reformulation, I think, of, of, of the dynamics there. 
And, and you know, we all know how much MONUSCO costs, all that money that is spent. And at the same time, the same international community that's funding MONUSCO uh, is, finds itself in a position where it isn't capable or isn't willing to criticize, for example, a Rwanda or a Uganda uh, about its role in Congo. Now that has also changed over time um, and it's become more critical or more willing to be critical. But I think that we need to be very honest about uh, what's driving instability in, 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 in that region. And, and that will certainly help MONUSCO. Um, and if MONUSCO, I think, is, is, is I mean, it, I, I, maybe I won't go into the difficult relationship that MONUSCO sometimes has with, with the, the government in Kinshasa, but that I think would also be simplified somewhat um, if, if, if we could have a regional process. Now, obviously, MONUSCO has an important role to play on many different levels because you're not going to bring peace to the, to the Eastern DRC overnight, and we all know that because it ha hasn't happened for 30 years. There, there's a role it can play in DDR in, in helping destabilize certain regions. Um, it can also, of course, play a political role in conversations with, with the, the central government. Um, the FIB, a regional coalition, I mean, I know that this is something that SADC is quite keen on and that there's, there are tensions between SADC and the UN about where, about the future of the Force Intervention Brigade, whether it can be independent, who would finance such a thing, and what its mandate might be. I think um, those are important conversations to have. But I think one of the things I've, I've, I've tried to say, emphasize, is that military approaches alone to trying to eradicate armed groups in the Eastern DRC and in the region are not gonna work. And so even if we have uh, a regional coalition, um, let's say it's the SADC FIB, um, it, it, it isn't in and of itself going to change the current situation. Uh, we, we need an accompanying political process. I also think, and, and you know that that if if the FIB were not under Monusco under a Monusco uh, banner, we would have more political objection from Rwanda and Uganda in particular about what their motivations are, what their alliances are, who they're really, uh, uh, what 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 they're really trying, their neutrality. Um, so I think um, it, it's a complicated one, but we 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 have versions of what we're getting in the Sahel and what we're getting in the Lake Chad Basin already in, it, in the FIB. It's just that the FIB is much more restricted because it is part of MONUSCO. Um, so I don't know if I've answered your question, but I tried. Okay, thank you. The next one comes from uh, Johanna Wolf de Tafur, and she says, many thanks for this timely and interesting presentation. I'm a consultant working for GFA and our project is implemented for and with the ICGLR in partnership with GIZ. Um, she says, um, from your point of view, which would be the key elements that would make a successful program? They are working on a program on developing a regional peace education program for the Great Lakes region, formal and non-formal education. From your point of view, which would be the key elements that would make for a successful program on um, education uh, in, in the region. And then she also followed up with a second question. Considering the national and cultural differences, which elements are crucial to make it a truly regional approach? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. That's an interesting question. I mean, I'm not a specialist on, on education programs, um, but I'll, I'll speak a little bit about an experience I had um, last year at the Kampala Dialogue, which was held, which was an event that the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung held at um, Makerere University, and where we as speakers were, were speaking about many different things, but the, the, our audience was was essentially students at Makerere, which, as you may know, or probably know, is is a very multicultural. Uh, university, obviously Anglophone, but um, has many students from the region. And it really occurred to me in the conversations that we were able to have with, with many students, how little um, uh, uh, students or people, youth from the different countries know about one another's history and how we, we don't have a good his, recent history, really, a good understanding of recent history in that region, of, of, of Uganda's understanding of why its army went into Congo, why it stayed there for so long. Um, you know, DRC on its side, on trying to understand why, you know, where the FDLR came from, what the FDLR's history in Uganda, or well, the Indrahamwe's history in, 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 in Rwanda was. We have, we have youth on both sides that are assuming, I think, um, very much news and a lot of propaganda and a lot of what politicians are, are, are trying to tell them, but who, um, of course, 
have contact with one another all the time and these are these are border zones and so people are always moving across but but no real deep understanding of of what's been driving the politics and the history in their region and and that to me is is a really big problem um and and we really need to focus on that because i think that you know as we often do we, we will find that the that the commonalities and the and the, the shared interests and the mutual interests between the citizens of those countries are much greater than their government might like them to think, um, and that the citizens of Rwanda and Uganda aren't at odds with one another uh, really at all, but their leadership might be. And so that I think is something we really, really need to work on and that really needs to be, be considered. And of course, if you're working with the ICGLR, you know that the origins of that body were to try and um, nurture uh, those exact precisely those kinds of, of deeper relationships also between civil societies. And I think one of the problems we really do have is that is that we don't we, we, we have these fora for civil society, but I think they're too they're too they don't really ever achieve the kind of dialogue and exchange that we want to. And so we, I think we need to be more um, creative about how we get civil society together and around what we form campaigns. Um, and, and, and also, I know that there are, of course, many attempts or efforts, um, sometimes box ticking exercises, if we're honest, to try and bring civil society into some of these bigger high level processes like the PSCF or AU uh, conversations about peace and security. And unfortunately, um, it is often an afterthought. And I think we really need to change that. And I don't you know, you're the education expert. Perhaps you have some ideas. But for me, those are things we haven't done well enough. Um, and, 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 then, and, and that's certainly a problem. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee who said, would the recommendations of the UN mapping report 1993 to 2003, which is already nearly 20 years old, if implemented, would it end, end impunity, promote reconciliation and enhance stability? Or is it, you know, or have we moved on? Has the picture moved on so, long, so much from there? Or does it still have any currency, I guess? No, I think it has absolutely has currency, and 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 it's a it's a big issue at the moment for a variety of reasons. Um, and Dr. Mukwege, of course, Nobel Prize winner Dr. Mukwege, very much put it back into the into the news or into the discussion recently by saying that you know as long as we, as long as we don't, as long as we have impunity in the Great Lakes, we can't have peace, and we also can't have a change in behavior. And I think he knows of what he speaks because he lives in Bukavu and has seen some of the most horrific consequences of instability and war there for 20, 30 years. So we, we, we hear what he says, it comes from a very credible voice. And I think um, he is right. There is, it, 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 there is a culture, there is a culture of impunity. There's never been a, a sufficient accountability um, for any of the crimes committed during that period. It's a short period, 93 to 2003. And, um, you know, just today I was listening to the Minister of Interior, the Congolese Minister of Interior, talking about how, you know, uh, that it, it, the Chisikiti government only came to power two years ago. It's not really, uh, it, it's not its responsibility. But it, it, it is it is an interesting period because it addresses a period where we had Rwandan troops in Congo, we had Ugandan troops in Congo, we had Burundian troops, we had Ethiopian troops, we had Namibian, Zimbabwe, and many, many different countries involved. And we had huge crimes being committed against Cong Congolese civilians, and the I would say the patterns of crimes that were that that we still see today. So military officials um, uh, involved in many of these things, um, and never being never being held accountable. Uh, often military leaders who have uh, important links to civilian leaders as well, and we we won't break the cycle of violence if people feel uh, that they can they can kill civilians um, or take up arms with impunity. I mean, that's a very simple thing. We, we know it from many different conflicts across the world. So I do think that that is a, a really important document that we have never really looked at. And again, I think it's it's also because there's a reluctance to, um, to look at the role that Rwanda in particular played then. Um, that was still a time I was living in the DRC uh, in Kinshasa at the time. That was still a time where people were unwilling to acknowledge that, you know, the RCD was a Rwandan proxy and that the MLC was a Ugandan proxy. And so um, there's a lot of pain in Congo from those years. Uh, and, and, and it also covers, for example, what happened to the many um, hundreds, well, we, we don't know the number, but uh, estimated hundreds of thousands of Rwandan Hutu refugees who went missing. Um, you know, in, in, in that period nine, between 96 and, and, and 97, when Rwanda was helping uh, um, 
Kabila come to power. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people simply disappeared. And, and those are Rwandan citizens and Rwandan civilians. And so it's a region where so much blood has been shed by so many different actors that there has to be uh, a process of, of accountability. Okay, thank you. Then the two questions I'm gonna ask uh, together. The first is on uh, Rwanda and then on South Africa. Uh, thank you. How, this is from Gihana Kennedy. Um, how can we have peace in the region if one, uh, General Kagame is creating rebel groups to overthrow Bujumbura government and also supporting ADF against Uganda, and Kagame has closed all democratic space in the country for the past 26 years. And then from an anonymous attendee, thank you for an interesting presentation. How would you evaluate South Africa's role bilaterally? but also in multilateral fora, like being the AU chair, sitting on the United Nations Security Council, SADC, in positively influencing the instability in the Great, Le Great, Great Lakes region or, or otherwise, I guess. So uh, Rwanda's role and South Africa's role. Okay, thanks. So um, to Kennedy, I mean, I think, um, you know, that we, I would, I would agree that the way in which Kagame governs Rwanda contributes to instability in the Great Lakes region. Um, now, how does one convince someone like Kagame that he needs to change? I mean, I think that is a, a, that's the million dollar question, right? Um, obviously, uh, the, the proposal that I'm making is that, that some, you know, that the international community has to try and herd everybody to the table um, using its own leverage, but that the African, in my view, if there's no, if there's no, um, balance or if there's no counterbalance or if there's no uh, if there's no African uh, partner in such a thing we're not going to see a political process that anybody takes takes seriously and so it's 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 an effort of of looking at this region and saying again really what what do we have to do to to change the dynamics and of course one of those things is 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 having greater democracy in Rwanda having um you know, free and fair elections, having allowing Rwandan citizens and political opponents to be able to speak freely without being punished or imprisoned. I mean, that's that's without question an issue, uh, a fundamental issue. Um, and so uh, I think until the time where that can be a conversation that the leadership in Rwanda is willing to engage in, we're going to see many of the patterns that we currently see uh, continue. So uh, I think that's that's a fundamental issue. South Africa's role bilaterally, multilaterally, and positively in influencing stability. So I think um, I'll stick with the positive part because I do think South Africa has played, uh, you know, over the years, and I won't go all the way back in ancient history, but has played has played a positive role uh, at, at different times. I think it could have done much more, in particular in the last ten years. Um, and, and, and when I say much more, I mean politically, I, when it comes to speaking um, clearly uh, uh, with the governments of the region, um, South Africa for a very long time was unwilling to criticize Kabila about his attempted third term. That was still when Zuma was president, but it, it was a South African position, a formal South African position. This also meant that SADC multilateral, so that its, it's uh, voice in SADC was uh, very mild when it came to anything that Kabila uh, was was doing, um, and and that was a real disappointment for many. Um, it was also extremely disappointing, and uh, and I'm I'm sorry that I'm I'm I'm, I'm I am now not speaking about the positive. But when South Africa was 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 taking up the seat on the Security Council in early 2019, and wasn't willing to be more vocal about um, about the electoral fraud in the Congo. That, that, was, that was, I think, a, a position that um, we would have really wanted South Africa to try and, and take. And I know that Congolese civil society was really shocked by that. Um, and, 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 that's, and that's very unfortunate. Um, I think that there's, there are difficulties to the relation or to, to, to South Africa's interaction in that region. And I think that has a lot to do with the South African Rwanda relationship, which is very tense, but which for some reason, South Africa often, I think, even though I, I would argue it has greater soft power um, and, and greater economic power, certainly greater multilateral standing, South Africa often tends to, I think, um, be quite meek in the, that context. Um, and, and I'm not sure why that is. Uh, I think today, if South Africa were to stand up and say, we want to take an important role in the Great Lakes, um, that that would be welcomed by many, many players, you know, African and international. 
and that there would be a moral authority there, there would be um, history, because South Africa does have history in Congo, and obviously Burundi, I, I haven't spoken about Burundi, but uh, I think you asked only about Congo. Um, and, and so maybe, you know, much as some say it's not a player that needs to be in the Great Lakes, I don't agree with that. I think that it, it, it is a player and it should be a player also in, in, in continental issues. The fact that it hasn't stood up this year, I mean, we all know it's been a tough and unusual year, um, but it hasn't stood up on, on key issues this year either, um, when it had both the African Union presidency and the Security Council seat on some of these key issues is hugely disappointing. And, and again, I would argue that if we were to have to draw a line uh, as to where South Africa's sort of influence and natural place in African peace and security issues ends, I would say Central Africa is probably it. So South Africa getting in heavily involved in Mali uh, or the Sahel makes a lot less sense to me. But DRC, Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi, um, where we also have other SADC states that are involved, like Tanzania and, and Angola and Zimbabwe, um, and even Zambia. I, I think South Africa has a natural place there. And it would have been, I think, a good year to try and leverage that. And the final thing on that is I, I, South Africa did support with, with Belgium, who's also on the Security Council, an interesting sort of initiative about natural resources. And I said earlier, I think that that is a really fundamental element of what we have to address here to try and turn this illicit economy into an economy that drives regional growth. And, and that you know, regional growth is often the cement we need, the glue we need to try and diminish some of these, these um, conflict situations. Um, and South Africa did, did co-sponsor that uh, conversation at the Security Council, which I think was a really good concrete step. And if, if we could have seen more of that, I think that would have been would have been great. But again, I, I you know, Tabo Mbeki has played a big role in, in the DRC and I think did a really good job between 2003 and 2006, keeping on track the, the that transition period heading to elections in 2006. He was highly respected. Um, we've, we've had requests. I mean, we've had a funny situation with this whole idea of a South African envoy to the Great Lakes or even just to the DRC where the DRC pulled the plug on, on an initi initiative which had been announced by Durko. That was a very unfortunate incident because I think that there is absolutely a role and I think that South Africa can still muster a, a, a lot of momentum for these things. And um, so my, my uh, I, I would really like it if South Africa could play a role in this type of initiative. Great, thank you. Then a question from Greg Tembu Salter, who uh, I know has done some work for SI in the past. Hi, Greg. Thanks for joining us. A particular, a very particular question. Uh, Sonia Rolly of RFI has suggested repeatedly that there's a substantial RDF employment, deployment in Eastern DRC in pursuit of the RNC. The Rwandan government has denied it. Monusco has downplayed it. I'm not sure what the DRC government says. Who is right? Does Stephanie know? <laughs> oh wow thanks greg for that easy question um well look i mean I, it's not just sonia Rollet. We, we all know sonia is very well informed but it's not just sonia in fact it's also civil society in eastern congo that's been saying it for some time uh, i think the congo the congo research group spoke about it the, uh, the, the kibu security tracker so i think we 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 have uh we have some uh um decent indications that this is in fact true. Uh, we, we know that, you know, for example, Chisikidi last year, is it last year now or 2018, um, 20, yeah, 2019, um, had attempted to or had meetings with a number of different uh, key players from the region wanting to essentially invite Rwanda, Uganda and Burundi back into the Congo to go after the different groups that they felt threatened by and that they felt were facing themselves there. So um, I think we can honestly, I think we can say, or I feel comfortable today saying that the RDF is in and out of Congo on a regular basis and that that is something that we have seen again, or let's say another wave of it um, um, has taken place in the last, in the last year. Um, we also, I mean, and, and many people, again, uh, who, who work on armed groups in the Eastern Congo would argue that the Rwandans never left and that they are always there in one guise or another, whether it be, you know, infiltrations of the M23 or who are, you know, who have been re, re, re or integrated into the Congolese army or are there in one, in one way or another. So I think, um, yes, it's a big concern. And for me, it's a, the reason to be concerned about this and the reason why it's important that we state it clearly is that this whole idea of, of informal military involvement um, and the fact that Chisikedi is okay with that is, to me, 
you know, a huge step backward. I mean, it, it's the kind of thing that that we saw under Kabila, where Kabila was making concessions under duress to the to the to Rwanda. It's something that he did, in my view, I think, also because there were interests that were at the center of that relationship. And Chisakiti is new to this field, I, or new to this this relationship with Rwanda. Um, to my knowledge, um, he doesn't have you know, deep interests at, yet in, in Eastern Congo. Uh, and so it's not his personal network that would be threatened. Um, if he were to say to Rwanda, we, we do things transparently now. And if, if, there's a, if there's an issue with the RNC, then we have a conversation about that. We communicate clearly. Uh, we don't do things informally, um, uh, especially not when it comes to military interventions. And I think it, it worries me that, that this pattern is being repeated with a new, with a new government. Um, that I think could have could have steered things in a different direction. So I hope I've answered that question. Right. There's a comment from Jeremy uh, Jerry Dungu. I think you've you've largely covered this. Uh, uh, unless there's something specific you want to say, but his comment is: Do you think Rwanda is sincere about peace in the DRC? It looks to me it is that it is encouraging instability in Western DRC. I mean, I'm sure that's Eastern DRC, so that it can uh, allow the illicit trafficking of minerals. Rwanda has built refining, refining plants for coltan, a, min, a mineral it does not possess. So Rwanda will benefit as long as there's instability in the DRC. I think you've covered that, but you're welcome to, uh, to jump in. And then uh, another one by an anonymous attendee. How effective have the roles of non-state actors been to prevent and manage conflict in the Eastern DRC? Okay, um, thanks. I, I think that the question about Rwanda is um, answered maybe by just saying that Rwanda benefits quite substantially, or the current Rwandan military and civilian elite benefits quite substantially from the status quo. Um, and uh, so, so that's one way of saying no, it's not necessarily interested in a change, uh, a change or a move towards greater uh, stability in the Eastern Congo. Could Rwanda benefit from stability? I think the answer is yes. I mean, you mentioned the, the, the smelter and there's also gold smelters and so on. Um, and there are, I, I wouldn't say legitimate, but there are push or, or, or reasons and having to do with, with Congolese taxation systems that mean that gold and other resources are smuggled and are then um, uh, processed elsewhere. Um, but yes, of course, Rwanda could benefit from a from a from a from a stabilization and from a legal and, and a legal economy, a, a legal exploitation, legal not illegal, exploitation of resources in in eastern DRC. And there's no reason why the entire region can't benefit from that. Um, and so I think it's a question of saying today we have a small group of people benefiting from from the status quo, whereas if we were to try and formalize a lot of this, we'd see the populations of the region benefiting from the status quo. So uh, I'll answer it that way. And then the question, sorry, the last one, would you mind repeating that? Uh, how, how effective have non-state actors been in preventing and managing conflict in Eastern DRC? Non-state actors, okay. Um, are we talking about civil society or? I, I guess so. Yeah. Well, look, um, in managing conflict in the DRC, um, I mean, it, it, you know, there are many, many, many different layers. I've spoken today only about what I consider to be the regional aspects of, of conflict, but there are many uh, very local aspects of conflict um, uh, in DRC that need to be managed by local actors. And I think the local traditional actors, religious actors, civil society um, who manage conflict, I think on a very much on a daily basis. And so, so they are, they are in, in part of the ecosystem in terms of bringing uh, large scale stability to, to the region. Um, I wouldn't say that, that, that non-state actors have been able to do very much. Um, but I think that there is always the work that is done about calling attention to key issues. For example, uh, you know, even 20 years ago, we weren't nearly as uh, well informed about sexual violence in Eastern Congo. We weren't nearly as well informed about the patterns of illegal uh, mineral exploitation. Um, and so that, that work has been largely done by non-state actors to, to drive that awareness and to drive some of the policies that have, that have responded to that. Um, in terms of Congolese civil society, I think we have some really good examples of very engaged movements like La Lucha um, and Filimbi who have, I would say, 
played a substantial role in in convince and also the Catholic Church, I should add, in in convincing, for example, Kavila not to stand for a third term, and in trying to kind of keep accountability on the agenda with this new new government, which for me is also sort of an aspect of conflict management. Um, so that I would say they're. they're, they're they're definitely part of the ecosystem and have played at different levels uh, important roles. Okay, thank you. Another uh, question about minerals from Greg, um, Tempu Salta. A point about gold. On the UNGOE, we have traditionally estimated artisanal gold production in Eastern DRC at 10 to 15 tons. But the last UNGOE report identified gold refining capacity in East Africa of 337 tons. And almost all of this is coming from the DRC. Even if these refineries are only a quarter full, that's still over 80 tons. This should change our analysis about the role of gold in conflict and illicit financing flows in the region. Are we taking this seriously enough? Well, I think um, Greg knows this area extremely well. Um, no, I think we're not taking it seriously enough, and I think we, you know, we need to put it back on on the agenda. Like we need to put a number of different different things back on the agenda. And gold is featured persistently. So, I mean, uh, you you've done the math on the on the increase, um, but I think we know that that has become an inc like a greater or, or how would I how should I say a new anchor. Of, of interests for Rwanda and Uganda over the last over the last few years, and so it's a it's it's a it's a growing element of of the network. Um, certainly. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, we've got a, a couple of other questions about Rwanda, but really, I think you've you've covered them. Um, from Jerry Dungu, what do you think will be the benefits of the special international criminal court that's being requested uh, by Dr. Mukwege, the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize winner? Um, well, I think he's, that's, that's back to that question about the mapping report. Um, so Mukwege has basically said we need to, we need to get serious about um, pursuing these crimes. Um, and like I said, I mean, it's, it's when we don't have accountability, we have impunity and impunity drives armed actors, you know, drives corruption, it, it drives all the, all the bad behavior we see. Um, by by governments and by by individuals, military, civilian, etc. Um, because because quite frankly, if you don't get you know if you don't have to pay for your for your for your crimes, why why would you ever stop? Um, and I think it's you know so and, and and so there's there's the obvious sort of you know deterrent factor, or one would hope that that would be an element of, or that's at least the argument that that these kinds of trials um, have a deterrent. Uh, uh, deterrent effect. But I think we also need to be very mindful, and this is not my area, but um, of, 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 of healing and reconciliation. Um, and, and again, that for me is very much a regional issue. And it's also an issue back to the question earlier about education, about educating populations about the kinds of violence that has affected all of many people in the region, um, often perpetrated against different civilians from different countries, but by the governments of of the region, uh, and 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 that's I think what Mukwege is saying, and 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 even just I mean you know when you have a period of time in your history that is so violent and there's so so much loss um, to gloss over that what, what does that what does that mean for your future and what does that mean for the future of the populations um, and your national identity and just just your own understanding if you never. If you never address that, if you never speak to it, if you pretend it didn't happen, and I think that's that, that that's my sense of where he's tried to go with this. Um, Thank you. Then there was just a comment; it's not a question, but uh, uh, Gihana Kennedy says, "I've talked to many experts in the region about the RNC. RNC is not a rebel group, but a political organization. They've been requesting negotiations with Kagame without any success. It's propaganda of General Kagame to continue to be in DRC resources." RDF has been in South DRC to trade red to Baro of General Neon Barre to overthrow the, Burun, the Bujumbura government. Again, I think you've touched on, on that and that's a comment rather than a question. Okay, here's an interesting one. What is the role of the Western powers, the USA, the IMF and the World Bank in promoting regional stability in Eastern 
uh, in the Great Lakes region. I honestly don't think these powers are innocent, as the presenter seems to suggest. In my view, these could be the real drivers of large-scale genocide in Eastern DRC and not Rwanda, Burundi and Uganda, if a deep analysis and research is done. So uh, there's a, a challenge to you, Stephanie, on uh, are you looking at the wrong suspects here? Um. <laughs> okay, I no, I don't think I'm looking at the wrong suspects. In, in my view, the international community has a lot of explaining to do, absolutely. Um, and I mean, I, I mean, it's a very big question, obviously, and many things have happened. But for me, the, the biggest failure of the international community is there, there is the, the amount of time it took them to speak clearly about the dynamics that were at play in, in violence in Congo. Um, especially Rwandan and Uganda's Rwanda and Uganda's role, the reluctance to to point a finger very clearly at the perpetrators of the violence, um, and that was essentially because of alliances, relationships, the history of the genocide in Rwanda in particular, um, and, and and a desire to to I think guilt over not having intervened, and a desire to to kind of you know support Rwanda and Uganda as well. Um, over those years, um, and 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 that to me is the biggest failure of the international community because it's what's allowed. It's one of the key factors in allowing all of this to drag on for as long as it has, um, and and that continues to be a major problem. I, I won't go into the, uh, the the what I suspect may be one of the questions here, which is about um, mining. There are lots of issues with mining. Obviously, um, there is a. And again, Gregory can correct me here, but there are different dynamics. We have largely artisanal mining that we are speaking about now in Eastern Congo with regards to the track and tracing and gold and coltan and the, and, and the three Ts. Whereas the, 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 the bigger role played by Western and industrial is in industrial mining, which is essentially in Katanga and to some extent in gold, um, but is much less uh, prevalent in Eastern Congo. Um, are there economic interests that the Americans have, for example? Of course. Are there economic interests that the Belgians and the French have? Of course. Have they pursued those at the expense of human rights of people in the region? Absolutely. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not uh, in any way uh, suggesting that they haven't. And it's one of the reasons that I think that what we need to have now is not so much these bilateral uh, approaches to countries in the Great Lakes. For example, this argument that, that people often make that Rwanda is the most stable regime in the region. I, I think it's a very threadbare argument. Um, stable for who? Um, stable for, I don't, you know, I mean, you, you can answer that question many different ways. Um, but uh, so, so I, 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 I don't, I, I think that the answer is there are many players who, who are involved here. Um, but, and it's not an either or, um, but I certainly also want to say that Rwandan and Ugandan and Congolese and Burundian actors are, are very much players in the violence and, 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 and are, have, have played a role in that. So it, it's not just one or the other. Mm. Um, there's a good question to ask whether the instability arms on groups, illicit criminal activities in the Great Lakes region, is that related to for example, other areas of the continent, for example, northern Mozambique that we've seen flare up over the last three or four years. Is there, uh, are you aware of links between, between groups there or, or are these separate conflicts? Honestly, I, 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 people have been asking me about this a little bit the few, last few days. I'm, I, I personally have not heard anything that I would be willing to go on record with um, at this point. Um, and, I, and I'm not even sure exactly what those links would be. I, I, I know that, of course, we for years now have been going around and round with this question of whether the ADF have links to the Islamic State. And for a very long time, and I suspect that that's, that's probably where this, this question about links to northern Mozambique lies, um, that we, for many years, the, the, the primary um, voice saying that the Islamic State was support, or that there was an Islamic, a link to Islamic extremism was the Ugandan government. And of course, they had every interest in saying that because they're, you know, one of their, one of their, one of the ways they remain a very important ally for the Americans in particular is by acting as a bulwark against terror, spread of terrorism in East Africa. And so that, that, that was a very useful thing for them to try and perpetuate. It was never really substantiate, substantiated, or I should say not until I think 2019, the, the, um, the UN experts report and a few others were able to document, you know, they were able to find 
I think there was one transfer of 50,000 US dollars to the ADF um, by uh, someone linked to another, to the, to the Islamic State and so on. And, and then there were some, um, uh, there was some propaganda, written propaganda found in some of the camps. I, I think that even that was much uh, less than, than people had uh, tried to make in terms of the links between the movements. So I, I, honestly, the short answer is I don't know. Um, it's something I'll look into, but I, I can't say that I, it's not something I can speak about definitively at all. Okay, thank you. Um, looking uh, more towards solutions and causes uh, from Maurice Paulison. Thank you for an interesting presentation. You mentioned the AU should take the lead in a new regional political process and that there's a specific chance next year with Ch Chisakedi as AU president. Which international player, is it South Africa, could make the push for the AU to take up such a role next year? Which country or group of countries could make it happen? My sense is that uh, countries like DRC try to keep themselves off the agenda as much as possible. Um, so, so, you know, is, might we see something from the AU and, and who, who are the likely uh, drivers of, of something like that? Yeah, I mean, you're right. Um, unless, unless, of course, you think that Chisikidi, well, you're right that countries try to stay off the agenda, unless you think that Chisikidi or you feel that Chisikidi is somebody who can be convinced to take this process seriously, right? And, and I think that's my point of departure is that we still have that opportunity to, to, to try and have that conversation. Um, now, like I said originally, I, I can't decide whether it's an opportunity that he's the president of the AU or it's an impediment. Um, whether it makes it seem like he's putting his own issues at the center and trying to push his own issues. I, I can't quite figure that one out uh, yet. Um, I, I think, though, that the countries that have to push that kind of thing, I mean, it, it is unfortunately sort of left to some of the usual suspects, and I would say South Africa is one of them. I think Angola, uh, and, 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 and I mean, you know, I just, I should add that this paper is meant to be one of several, and so we haven't explored at all the Angola relationship here. Uh, but there is an important one. And I think Angola might be one of those countries that can do that. Uh, Angola is not a disinterested actor, I should say, um, but, you know, um, so, so, so some of those countries, Kenya also, I, I mean, there, there was a time when there was a very good relationship between, uh, between the Kenyan president and, and Chisikedi. Um, I think that's uh, potentially a, a, a useful player. Um, and having those kinds of heavyweights push this kind of thing, I think, I think would be would be would be useful. Now, obviously, there are other reasons. We focus primarily on on DRC, but it would also, I, I would hope, include some level of substantive discussion on Burundi, which is an acute situation, obviously. Um, and so there's there's there are many reasons I think to to try and and, and push the AU to do this. I, it would be something that would not be coming necessarily out of a, a peace and security council conversation or early warning approach to the Great Lakes, but much more sort of a special initiative where you would also have a specific mediator um, who would be dedicated to to this job um, and somebody who would have to be chosen very wisely. Um, and, and the AU has a bad history there. I mean, it, it, it shows um, Edem Kojo, for example, for the UN, for the AU Inter-Congolese Dialogue, and that wasn't a great choice. So um, a, a lot of things would have to be, but, but I feel it would have to come right, if I can put it that way. But I do, th I do think that there's the potential to do that. And I think that that's where the international community, um, actors like the US and the US, again, also has a particular approach it's taken at the moment, um, but the EU, um, the UK, the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, where we can try to open this, crack this open a little bit and encourage that. Um, and it can also be about saying, you know, driving regional economic integration. I mean, that's a conversation that everybody's always wanting to have. And the AU has its, um, I forget exactly what the acronym is, the, 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 the free trade zone. I mean, there are many different ways, I think, into why you would want to convince the AU to do this. Um, and I think Musa Faki, I mean, has shown himself willing to, to take some new initiatives here and there. And of course, ultimately, even if Chisikidi has the presidency, this has to come from the commission itself. Um, just to flag to your moderator that there's been a hand raised uh, for okay. quite some time now. And we also do have a, a question on the chat function, just to raise that uh, to your attention. Thank 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We'll go uh, to the chat function. Well, we've actually interestingly got two uh, attendees from South America. The first one, Gladys, says thank you very much for choosing a proper time so that South Americans who are five hours behind us at least can participate, which is great. And then from Ricardo Benitez from Explorando Africa uh, Research Center at Buenos Aires University, what elements should change for to end the state's deprivation system in DRC? And what responsibility has the international community on this issue? And then in terms of the hand raised, uh, Luanda, how do I, uh, is, is that somebody who, would, who we would unmute and speak? Yes, Steve, if you're recognizing them, I can un allow okay, them to Okay, so please, please do so. That's Dan Mortuma. I've given them permission to speak. Okay, just so Dan Moore, please un unmute yourself. Okay, go ahead. Uh, wait, no. Dan Moore, can you un unmute yourself? There we go. Please ask your question or make your comment. Dan Moore, are you there? Going. Going on. Okay, seems not to be there. If he comes back, he or she comes back later. Um, Somebody is, we, we're coming towards the end. If people would like to stay on, we can go on for another 10 or 15 minutes. We've made Stephanie work very, very hard uh, and a uh, uh, really wide range of questions. So if you have to go, please feel free to, to leave us at the at uh, three thirty, but we're probably going to just try and get through as many questions as we can, and we'll go a little bit over. But it's not rude if you need to leave and you have something else. Um, uh, Anonymous says, as you said, the international community hopes Chisakedi will succeed in making a difference. What means can the international community use to force the countries in the region to help Chisakedi? So, what, so what kind of uh, incentives, positive and negative, uh, can there be for 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 creating this kind of regional? win-win uh, uh, situation? Well, I, well it's a, that's a very good question. I mean, I think that, first of all, we have to get um, a more a, a more honest assessment of some of the governments in the region. Um, now, and, and and again, I mean, I, what I mean is, you know, of, of their of their actions, of their of their lack of tolerance for political opponents, of their lack of tolerance for freedom of speech, and so on. I mean, there's been a huge emphasis on that being a problem in DRC. Um, more and more, that has become a criticism of Uganda and increasingly Rwanda. But I think it's not, um, you know, commensurate with what the kind of situation we we are seeing in that country. Um, we also, I think, need to be more willing to. To, to actively sanction or name and shame some of the actors who are regional, who are playing a role in, in destabilizing Eastern DRC or destabilizing their neighboring countries. And I think, and this is back to the point that uh, Kennedy made, we also need much more information. We, we, I, one of the recommendations that I read out was this idea that we give the group of experts uh, or a different group, but that, is, that has similar uh, makeup and, and mandate and so on, um, the explicit mandate to go and look into some of these allegations about the RNC, about armed support to Red Tabara and so on. I, again and again, we, we go around the table on this. And like Gregory said in his question, you know, Sonia Rollet says, but actually we, we, we have been able in that instance, for example, to know that this is in fact true. And these kinds of allegations, I mean, it's been, this is the way the region works, right? And I think that the regional leaders know that very well. Um, and because there's often, because often this kind of support is very likely, you can make the allegation, no one ever actually investigates it. And then, you know, it becomes sort of a, a, a part of the a layer of the dynamic. In fact, with, and, and this is a roundabout way of answering the question, but in fact, with, in, it's part of this um, um, quadripartite process that we're having between Rwanda, Uganda, and uh, Angola and DRC, and with the support of the UN Special Envoy's Office and the Enhanced Joint Verification Mechanism, um, there there was they were at the point of agreeing that where Uganda was saying, look, you 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 accuse us of having supported the the RNC in X location, you know, please let's have a let's have a mission there and let's look at that. Um, those are the kinds of things I think we need to push. We need to push like you know these 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 allegations that are put out there. Then let's investigate them. 
Um, that's one thing. I think we need much more transparency and understanding, and that needs to be part of a constant regional dialogue. And so pushing these governments to share information and to allow for those kinds of investigations to take place, I think is one thing. Putting you know, putting them, making, forcing them to put their money where their mouth is in some ways. Um, and, and then not having a double standard. I mean, I, we have, we've, we've, for decades, we've had double standards in terms of policies towards the DRC, Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi. And, uh, and, 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 it, and it hasn't worked and it's driven, it's driven these imbalances. Um, and that I think is, is something that the, that the, especially donor governments should, should really look at. Um, I mean, you know, freezing out a country doesn't always work either. We know that from Burundi, unfortunately, where, where the withdrawal of substantial aid hasn't brought an end to the really terrible circumstances there. So one has to be very careful. But, um, but I think, you know, we, yeah, we need to start with some, some leveling the playing field and, and, and speaking, you know, honestly about what's happening across mm -hmm. the region. Um, I think you've largely answered this, but you may want to elaborate a little bit by uh, a question from Sipo Gideon Mantula. What is the role of SADC, South Africa, and also civil society in the peace building process? I know you've touched on that. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to you'd like to add. Look, not really. I mean, I think, you know, SADC, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a tough one. I mean, uh, um, and I've said what I think I, I can say about about South Africa's role. I think it could be could be extremely uh, helpful, um, and then it could also, of course, leverage SADC as well. Um, SADC and ICGLR working together is really important. I think that's something that South Africa could again uh, try and nurture. Um, yeah, um, there was, you know, for example, many years ago when during the transition period in the DRC, there was something called the Comité International à l'accompagnement à la transition. So it was like this, this sort of support framework for the pr tr transition process where um, key countries that had a role to play and that had played a role in Congo um, were able to kind of act as consultants and, 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 and good offices. And I think that's the kind of structure that we already have with the International Contact Group, where you know SADC should be part. And you know the International Contact Group meets every year, all the special envoys. Often the African players don't show up, um, and and they should, I think. Um, and that's a forum that I think we can repurpose or use and, and drive. I, I think there are many different options for that kind of interaction with South Africa and SADC, and also civil society. And I think, yeah, yeah. Can I ask you from the chair? I mean, we saw when Abiy Ahmed came to power in Ethiopia that he took this bold step to end the enmity between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Is there an equivalent bold step that any of the leaders that we've talked about today could take to change the game? You know, he, he landed up making peace where there had been this rumbling conflict for a long time. I know the circumstances may be different and they always are, but can you, you know, can you think of a a, a, a bold step like that that could change the dynamics? Well, I think if, if, if the presidents of Rwanda or Uganda were willing to ex to publicly state that their armies and their, you know, had, I mean, we're never going to see that happening. When does the president say my army did this wrong? You know, I mean, that's not going to happen. But if they were to um, somehow in a way that was possible politically for them as well, acknowledge their role in destabilizing Eastern DRC, that would be a substantial step. Unfortunately, we're seeing quite the opposite at the moment with a lot of really strong reactions towards against Mukwege's call for, 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 for an application of the mapping report um, with even the Rwandan ambassador being critical of, of some of these things. And so that's that it, it's, 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 the tide is actually at the moment going in the opposite direction, but that would be, I think, a very, very substantial step. Um, and I think that the, one of the problems is that what I worry about or what I don't know is, is the extent to which Chisikiri is really trying to go at this relationship from a new approach and is, is, is trying to understand what drives it, what underpins it, legal, illegal, formal, informal, and so on, rather than just stepping into his predecessor's toes and inheriting this, this dynamic, which, which we all uh, know has been to the detriment of the region. So moving on to some other countries in the region, we, we are, we're going to take another 10 minutes if we don't get into, through all the questions, I apologize. Um, does Tanzania have a role? What are your thoughts on the Burundi refugees returning home from Tanzania, DRC and Rwanda? Does this promote more peace in the region? Well, I think, look again, I'm, I'll start with the, Tanz with the refugees. I'm, I'm not a, an expert on refugees, but um, at, at all, and I, I, I don't work in humanitarian spaces really, but um, clearly I think that, you know, the, the, the return of, of the refugees is a particularly difficult issue because 
it's not a voluntary return. It's essentially Tanzania withdrawing the welcoming map, so to speak, for Burundian refugees. I think many of the conditions that drove people to to flee, especially in 2015, are still very prevalent. And so the idea that you would be going back to an improved environment is, is false. Um, and, and so uh, it's worrisome. Um, obviously for Burundi, it's, it's sort of a, it's a way of saying, look, things are, things are fine. Uh, you know, even the refugees are coming back and, 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 you know, uh, that's, that's certainly one of the reasons I think that, that Tanzania or, well, that Burundi is very happy about it. Tanzania has its own reasons, including not wanting, you know, including its own dynamics on its, on its own territory. Um, and, you know, re re refugees, you know, in, in, Throughout the region um, uh, and, and IDPs, I mean, there 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 are are, are millions of them, um, and I don't think that, especially if you're a refugee from Eastern DRC, uh, that you know the conditions have have, have substantially improved. Um, the related question was Tanzania's role, right? Yes. So Tanzania, of course, is a, is a, is a, has always been a really important player in um, in, in in the Congo, and. Um, in, in, in a, a little bit like what happened in South Africa, where where um, Magufuli, when he became president, things changed quite substantially to from his predecessor, um, and and Tanzania became a, a country, to my knowledge, I mean I, I'm not an expert, um, that um, that withdrew very much from the from the regional and the international scene and is very much preoccupied with with its own issues. We I, I did. Um, specifically on the topic of Tanzania and the Great Lakes, hold a seminar last year in Dar es Salaam, and it was it was very difficult. It is still very much a political, it, or it, not still, it is very much a political issue. Um, Tanzania's approach to the Great Lakes and its relationships with regional actors is something that um, is, is, uh, uh, is, in, it, is yeah, it, it, it's politically sensitive in Tanzania. Um, it, it's, so I can't really answer the question. We do know that um, I think um, Daishi May either already has gone to Dar es Salaam or is planning on going to Dar es Salaam um, for reasons of borders and refugee populations. Those countries have a long history and also because of the you know, relationship between re the rebel groups that are now in power or former rebel groups, I should say, um, and and and, and, and using Tanzania as a base. I mean, there's a long historical relationship between Tanzania and the region. Um, I, I think, and, and there are also, I think, uh, substantial links uh, in terms of the illegal economy um, and, and flows going through, through Dar es Salaam. So, so there's a lot to explore there. I'm not of the view, or I, I haven't seen anything that leads me to believe that Tanzania now is willing to get engaged in this kind of uh, an effort. Um, simply because I think Magufuli is, is preoccupied with what, what's going on in Tanzania, which is unfortunate because I think obviously uh, there's a lot of history there and, and, and important relationships. Mm. So there's a comment from Chris Saunders who said, brilliant presentation, thanks. And then from uh, Emma Buki, isn't it a bit of a surprise how Chisiketi has been able to keep the rather fragile post-election peace together? Is there anything positive to learn about this? Uh, particularly looking at relations with both Kabila and opposition, in particular, main rival Fayulu. Um, well, I think it's, it, it, it's, I'm not quite sure what Emma means by, by peace. Um, I don't know if she's referring to the East or if she's referring to kind of the state of the country and, and, and lack of protest or, 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 or absence of protest. I, I'm not sure I fully agree with the fact that it is, that there is an absence Stability, rather, yeah. Um, look, I think um, I'm, I'm not not really surprised because I don't think that anything that Chisikedi has done so far uh, is that threatening to the people who were in power before. Um, I, I mean, and and we, we can go into many details. I, this isn't the right place to do that, you know, about the, who's been pursued legally and who hasn't, and so on and so forth, and and what happened to Kaimbi and and all of that. Um, I, I'm, but I, I think that he hasn't, and, and it worries me a little bit, um, really rattled anyone's cage too much when it comes to the stability issues in Eastern Congo. Um, I, I, and, and that makes me worry that maybe the interpretation is too shallow or too complicit with the old narrative um, and the old actors. Um, and, and, and that, 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 that we might not get the kind of change which I think we, we could and should get or need to get. Um, 
And and uh, yeah, so I, I I haven't really answered your question too much, Emma. I mean, there have been there have been you know rearranging of various different um, positions in the in the army, but again, not nothing too threatening to to the old elite. Um, and I think also you know everybody's still trying to find their way around this arrangement. And at the beginning, I thought there, that it might settle into something, whereas what I'm finding is that actually it's constantly rearranging and then settles and then kind of changes again. And, um, and, and, and for me, what I watch instead is kind of these, these big, big issues around elections and the CENI and, and military uh, forces and who's in charge of what. Um, but I'm not, I'm not totally surprised that he, he's been able to, to, to manage it so far um, because I don't think he's really, I think he's made a lot of accommodations. Uh, obviously, his camp often argues that that's not the case, and, and nobody's privy to exactly what those conversations between Kabila and Shisekedi, those rare moments, um, are really all about. Um, but yeah. Okay, thank you. We're going to end off with uh, a question on uh, the Eastern DRC seems to be one of the greatest tragedies of our lifetime. What would it take to make it more strongly on the world agenda? All, uh, and the examples are given here of Burma and Palestine. Um, what, 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 you know, uh, how do we get the world to take more notice? Well, I'm pretty sure that Burmese and, and Palestinian activists would, would argue that they're not on the world agenda yes. enough. And so I think I, I find that, you know, I mean, I'm a Great Lakes, you know, person. I've been working on it for so many years. And so I often sometimes forget that there are other parts of the world. Um, and I think that that is something that, you know, is also the case for citizens of Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi. And, and, and I understandably so in, in some ways. I think for, as a region, I don't think it's been neglected particularly. I think, uh, in other words, I don't think it's a forgotten crisis. Um, mm. I, I think uh, Maybe we've we've become a bit complacent with the tools we use and with the approaches we have. Um, uh, I think, for example, a huge missed opportunity really was what happened in uh, in 2018, or you know, with the election results, where we had some really really credible, good uh, alternative or, or real results about who won, and the international community and African regional actors and continental actors missed the chance really to. Uh, to, to support civil society and, and others where, and, and really push for, for that kind of a change in DRC. But if Fayulu were president today, he would still face the challenges in the region. Um, and I think fundamentally, you know, the, the thing is that this has to be dealt with by Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi, and DRC. Um, it's not something that can be fixed by external actors. They can support it, they can push it, they can finance it and all those things. And certainly they cannot stand in its way, uh, but it has, to, it, has to, it has to come from the region. Thank you, Stephanie. I just want to say a big thank you to you. Um, it's really great to have somebody of your caliber who has such a breadth and depth of, of insight into the region and follows it so closely. So thank you very much. I think everybody who listened enjoyed it and congrats on the paper. The, the details of the paper have been posted in the chat. We will also be having a French version coming out very, very soon. And in fact, as Stephanie said at the beginning, we'll be holding a, an equivalent seminar in French for Francophones. Um, also, just to say thank you very much to the events team at SIA, to Ndumi and to Luanda and to Sarasa for helping organize today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, if there are more questions, you can get hold of Stephanie uh, through our website. You can get, uh, you can get her, her, her details. Um, and thank you very, very much. And I wish you all uh, a wonderful week further. Thanks so much. Thank you. That's great. That was very good. Very good uh, discussion. Yeah, I thought so too. I don't know how many people we had, but thanks a we, lot. Really we were up lot. to about we were about sixty uh, in total at, at the highest. They came in and out, but uh, you know some some uh, some very good names. And uh, thanks, Steph. Thank you for pushing and and uh, you know it, it was. It, I don't think we needed a respondent in the end. So no, we didn't. We were okay. And thank you for yeah. keeping it alive and for coming out of your rainy leave. It's fun. <laughs> uh, I'll show you. I'm wearing a tracksuit under my uh, <laughs> under my my top suit. All right, guys, keep well. Thanks. Thanks to the technical guys. <laughs>